Well, I would like to welcome you all uh, to today's event. I'm Mark Cancy, and I'm a senior advisor here at uh, CSIS. Uh, the event is part of an ongoing series, the Maritime Security Dialogue, which is co-hosted by CSIS uh, and the Naval Institute. The series uh, seeks to highlight current thinking and issues um, facing the uh, Naval Services, the Navy, Marine Corps, uh, Coast Guard. Our event today is our first one of 2018, and we look forward to having you join us for uh, future events. Uh, we thank uh, Huntington Ingalls Industries for their uh, generous support of the series and making it uh, possible. I also need to make a simple administrative announcement here at the beginning in the unlikely event of an emergency. I will give instructions about what we'll do. What we'll do, we'll either um, hold fast or we'll move out uh, of the front door or the, or the rear. Uh, uh, now to our panel. Uh, we're fortunate in having a distinguished panel uh, with a broad set of experiences and responsibilities. Uh, we have General uh, Robert Walsh, a fixed-wing aviator, and now Commanding General of the Marine Corps um, Combat Development Command on Aquantico. We have uh, General uh, Brian Boudreau, uh, an infantry officer, and now Deputy Commandant for Plans, uh, Policies, and Operations uh, at Marine Corps Headquarters. We have uh, Lieutenant General Robert uh, Hedlund, a helicopter pilot and Deputy Commandant for Plans, Policies, and Operations. No, 2MEF. <laughs> Notes are wrong. I was gonna... <laughs> and I apologize, because I would have brought you back to, uh, up to Washington. No, 2MEF. Uh, and uh, Dr. Marin Lee, formerly of CSIS in the CNO's uh, office, now a senior an analyst at uh, Johns Hopkins University in the Advanced Physics Lab. Uh, and our program today is going to be as follows. We'll have a discussion uh, here uh, among the panel, and then we'll open it uh, for questions from the audience. So let me uh, start, and as we were talking a little behind uh, uh, the scenes here at uh, uh, beforehand, we have a new national defense strategy out. We have a new national security strategy. This highlights um, high-end competition. Comp um, talks about a long-term competition, particularly with Russia and China, uh, although it also notes um, uh, threats from North Korea, Iran, and uh, global terrorism. And I wanted to ask uh, first, what are the challenges and opportunities that that brings to the MAGTAF uh, at all levels? And uh, we can start, I guess, General Walsh, you can, we'll start there and we'll move down. Well, I think the, uh, the challenge it, it is, is um, as we looked at it, um, after many years of fighting counterinsurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the national defense strategy clearly focused on strategic competition against really uh, Russia and China's major strategic competitors, not just from a military standpoint. Uh, the NDS obviously focused on that, but the NSS also focused on it from strategically. And so I think what it did for us as part of the naval force, it really regrounded us as part of the Navy Marine Corps team on back to really our Title 10 responsibilities and how we would look at long-term strategic competition as a forward deployed force uh, across the globe uh, as, as the nation's force and readiness and how we do that. And I think the, the opportunity there is to get back to our Navy uh, roots, back to working with the Navy in partnership, and that's been very exciting across uh, the operating forces. Uh, General Hedlund can talk about that, um, but certainly from a headquarters Marine Corps standpoint, um, I also co-chair the Naval Board. General Boudreau's on the Naval Board with me, and there's a lot of uh, uh, things going on between the CNO and the Commandant to really drive towards bringing the two services together as we were in the Cold War towards major strategic competition. Uh, so I would say that would be the, the main part that I would say uh, the excitement of that opportunity. The other opportunity, and it's a challenge, is where have we been with our investments over the last 16, 17 years? That's been a real challenge. When you start taking a look at some of the capabilities that, uh, that we, in fact, used to have. Uh, for example, we used to have um, 
light anti-aircraft missile battalions. And when I go out and talk to our expedition warfare course and talk to our young captains, I mean, they look at me like I've got uh, three eyes when I talk about, yes, the Marine Corps used to have missile battalions, anti-aircraft missile battalions. So those are some of the, ch the, uh, the challenges, but I look at opportunities also as we now have to look at the force and go, how do we meet and pace the threat so we have the overmatch that we need across the force? So uh, first, thanks for this opportunity. It's, uh, it's always good to be a visitor in DC, uh, not permanently assigned. Uh, so it's great to be up from Camp Lejeune um, to be a part of the panel. So if, you know, we've mentioned the MAGTAF as a part of this emerging, uh, re-emerging really, uh, strategy that we have um, really used at TUMEF as a forcing function for building readiness. And as, a, uh, as an example, so TUMEF has just recently returned to being a, uh, a war fighting organization at the MEF level. Our war fighting formation for the last several years, because of many of the things that General Walsh had already uh, talked about, uh, was the, the MEB. So the Marine Expeditionary Brigade was the largest war fighting organization, largest MAGTAF on the East Coast. To MEF, the expeditionary force was not going to be assigned missions to go fight at that level. So this has really re-energized uh, an effort to, uh, with a nod to the both the NSS and the NDS, that this is really telling us to build a capability, rebuild the capability on the East Coast to have a war fighting organization at the force level. So uh, it again creates uh, some challenges, but it, I think there's far more opportunities uh, to reinvigorate uh, that warfighting focus uh, out of the, the Camp Lejeune complex. The so Carolina MAGTAF is very much excited about the opportunities there to rediscover some of the things that, uh, that we all, uh, we three in particular, grew up with uh, in the Marine Corps, um, have been nascent uh, or uh, dormant for the last 17 so years, and now we're having to, we're having to plan again uh, we're having to look beyond the next deployment. We're having to think about, okay, how do we, how do we recoup some time for Marines and families and, and equipment to be uh, better prepared for a larger fight should that come? So it, it, uh, we, have a, we have today's challenges, and then we've got these challenges that have been put out there by the NDS and the NSS, and how do we really build the bridge between the two? That's, that's going to be, I think, one of the exciting things that we'll have to work with here shortly. So with that, I'll turn it over to General Boudreau. Thanks, Fuzzy, and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I think the, uh, the NDS, the NSS, and, and importantly for us, the defense planning guidance that followed actually proceeded. Um, gives us a focus that we haven't had for a while. We've prioritized the threats which now allows the institution writ large to focus on that threat. It means we have to look at what we're studying in our schoolhouses and how we train officers for a high-end threat. <clears throat> what do we know about those adversaries and what don't we know about them, those, those competitors, let's say. Um, so this is more than just uh, the operational forces preparing. This is an institutional refocus on, on high-end warfighting and all that comes with it. it uh, with a good strategy comes good resourcing, and we're very, very pleased with the, uh, with the budget we've had in 18 and what pretends for 19 in order to resource a strategy, to be able to modernize the force, to maintain our competitive advantage that we do not want to lose against China or Russia. And this is not a whole of government or just a military approach. It has to be a whole of nation approach. Everything from how our students study and what they study to the industrial base and our ability to have resilient capacity. So sh should we have attrition in high-end warfare, we have an ability to regenerate a force. Um, things like recruitment, you know, it, it does concern us that perhaps less than 30% of the American population is even eligible to come into the military. You know, we need the nation to understand that and to broaden those who could even come in and serve in a high-end war fight to be able to replace and regenerate a capability should there be losses. I think it also, uh, gives the MAGTAF a, a thrust in a way that we haven't had, and it, and it really shows the, the brilliance of the, of the procurement of the F-35 and what it can do, anticipating this fight that was potentially to come in the future. Let's hope not, where competition remains short of conflict, 
But if it does, we have the right penetrating capability against an adversary who's got very sophisticated means to deny us or, or attempt to deny us. Um, and for the first time, we have uh, you know a threat-based, a threat-based strategy, not a capability-based strategy, and and uh, our intelligence is laser focused on that. Our Durant is laser focused on that. Our Marine Corps Training and Operations Group, who trains staffs, is focused on that out of 29 Palms and the way that we train and the, and the training infrastructure that has to support preparation for a high-end fight is an investment we're going to have to make. So if we're operating in a sophisticated electromagnetic spectrum, we need training ranges that, that allow our F-35s to do that. If we're going to get extended long-range precision fires weapon systems that go out to nearly 500 kilometers, we need ranges that support us and an ability to put a sensor and shooter together to operate at those kinds of ranges. So even something as simple as a, you know, what would seemingly be simple as a rifle with a higher caliber weapon that goes extended ranges. Our ranges at places like Camp Lejeune or even at Camp Pendleton in some cases have surface danger zones that are only designed to support training to a certain degree. We have to look at all of our ranges when we enhance the lethality. So, and again, with that strategy came the lethality task force, right? The, the secretary is committed on enhancing readiness and adding lethality into the force. And we've already benefited from the money that's come from OSD uh, under the lethality task force. We've been able to speed up procurement and things like shoulder launched uh, rockets enhanced night vision goggles, and more to come as we work with the Army. So there's been a galvanizing aspect of this. It's already been mentioned, the, uh, the re, uh, our reinstitutional warfighter talks with the Air Force that went dormant for 10 years. We've reinvigorated, reinvigorated a naval board to talk about the challenges in the Pacific uh, with, with a pacing threat that's out there that PAC fleet will lead under PACOM and MAR4 PAC. So again, it's been, a, it's been a galvanizing effort inside the naval board for future development and capability. And with the Army, it's been about procurement. Uh, munitions, long-range munitions, long-range systems, ground systems. So we get economies inside of our budget by working closer with the Army. So it's, it's been a, a huge amount of opportunity built into, uh, built into this defense strategy. You know, the force can fight today, and we can win today. There's no, make no doubt in anybody's mind about that. And maintaining this competitive advantage will allow us to ensure that that doesn't change from now until the 2049 when Xi Jinping will have a 100th anniversary, so, so, so to speak, of, of what China has been after. And so we know what path they're on in terms of their own development of capability. We're not going to cede any ground in that regard. Uh, so rest assured of that. Um, and I'll stop there. Turn it back over to you, Mark. Thank you. Marin, the last word here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. It's great to be back at CSIS. And uh, of course, I have to put the disclaimer on saying that my whatever I might say today are my personal views, not those of APL. But uh, so I'm, I think I'm going to take a slightly contrary view is, is my want. Um, <laughs> I, to me, one of the biggest challenges for the Marine Corps in the strategy uh, or the strategies um, is how they institutionally come to grips with what I think is a, an interesting challenge. One, the emphasis on uh, dynamic force employment or, and a more uh, deliberate approach to sort of husband readiness and, and increase surge capacity, which suggests that there will be much, will be less of a more persistent presence uh, that we've worked so hard to try to sustain in recent years. Um, and a, a, you couple that with the access challenges, and uh, that, I think, makes that problem a little bit harder. Um, it's, again, I think, acute, most acute, potentially, for the Marine Corps because of their uh, forward presence that would, in theory, enable the access, and they've been working hard on concepts to try to exploit that. Um, but how you do that if the Navy is not as present as it, or in, on a sustained basis uh, as they might have been in the past is something uh, I think that I'm, is going to require some additional adjustments to the growing relationship. Um, I think maybe suggest the Marine Corps need, needs to be uh, taking more deliberate actions to collaborate with the other services. Uh, in particular, I think SOCOM, uh, it implies that, again, if the Marines are going to be inside the bubble from the get-go, um, which I think at least to some degree 
would be expected. Uh, how, how do they work with SOCOM to leverage that to maximum effect to help uh, enable the access from the other services? Um, so again, I think while I'm a, a big advocate of the strengthening relationship between the Navy and the Marine Corps, um, I, I, I think it, it needs to, the Marine Corps needs to think about uh, broadening that and, and new concepts that extend beyond that um, because I just think that dynamic suggests it's changing a little bit based, or it suggests it should change, the strategy suggests it should change a little bit. Uh, and I don't think the F-35, while useful, solves that problem to, uh, to the degree that it's required. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that guidance gets implemented. Um, but again, I think it it's, um, creates the biggest tension for the core. So. I look forward to seeing how you guys are going to answer. <laughs> well, I, let, let me let me build on your question here and give uh, the generals a moment to, to think about their response, which, which is to pick up on this uh, dynamic force employment that is in the uh, NDS. And there's not a lot of uh, description, but the uh, outlines of that appear to be the idea of not being uh, um, uh, not being as forward deployed as much, so the that the force can husband some of its uh, capability for surge requirements. Uh, and I wanted, wanted to ask uh, uh, the panel, you know, how is that playing out? And I realize that this is still in its very early stages, but you know, do, we, do we expect to see MAGTAFs deploying in a different way as a result of this uh, concept? Thank you. I'll, I'll start with that. So Im importantly, as the NDS tells us what to focus on in terms of threat-based capabilities that are out there, our competitors, it also, in the defense planning guidance, tells us what not to focus on, the areas that we can accept risk as we focus on preparation for major combat operations, say, rather than counter just solely a CVEO fight. Um, the whole basis of our dynamic force employment is to remain operationally unpredictable. And so we're probably not going to say a lot about that to maintain our operational some degree of, uh, again, unpredictability. One might be able today to know exactly when the next carrier strike group is going to go, when the next ARG MU is going to sail, where it's going to go. Those days are going to change. And they'll change by year and they'll change by focus area. And there very much will be a tool at the discretion for the use of, the, of the, the Secretary of Defense in consultation with the Chairman and the Joint Chiefs on how those deployments, those dynamic force employment uh, deployments will, will be scheduled and where they'll go. Uh, it'll be, uh, it'll come from forward deployed forces as well as from surge forces from CONUS. We'll be able to conduct experiments within a force that's already forward deployed. So. In essence, that's, that's what we're trying to get after, is, is be very strategically predictable to our allies and partners and remain operationally unpredictable to those that take interest uh, other than being a partner. Any other uh, comments? Yeah. Yeah. I guess the one thing, that, just to uh, say what, and just counter a little bit with, uh, add to what General Boudreaux said is, like you said, is we've been a very busy force, the Navy and Marine Corps team, but with the strategic guidance that we've got now uh, in the strategic competition focused, like he said, on the DPG where the Marine Corps is focused, uh, much more so in the Pacific than we have in other AORs, that allows the Marine Corps to kind of reset some of its capability back where we've been heavily focused on just the Middle East. So it does give us some space there to be able to, to reset some of that force, to be able to focus much more so, as we talked about earlier, on higher end equipping, higher end training, and higher end uh, manning to go, go towards the guidance the uh, NDS is telling us to move towards. No, I guess I just, I think it's, um, I agree that focus is very helpful, and I think the question then becomes, um, there's also language in the strategies about thinking about more dynamic basing and, and posture uh, ways of approaching that challenge 
uh, how the Corps executes that in that theater. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to talk about and a lot harder to do, as you know better than I do. But uh, so what that ends up looking like, and again, uh, if you assume that, that that's sort of going to be most of what you start with if the bubble goes up, uh, if the balloon goes up, um, how then you maximize the flexibility and the uh, combat power of that force uh, around the theater to uh, create conditions for others to come in, I think is, is a real, it's, it's, a, it's a significantly different way of thinking about things than I think uh, the course had to think about for a while. So, um, and the degree to which you're gonna be able to leverage the Navy to do that, at least in the short term, uh, is, a, is sort of an open question in my mind, so. Let me, let me ask about picking up on another thing that um, uh, Marin had raised, which is A2AD environments. Uh, there's a lot of talk about that, uh, particularly with China and Russia, their um, ability to uh, build defensive bubbles around their homeland, and I realized that the CNO does not like A2AD, so uh, because it it sounds uh, um, uh, a little too uh, restrictive, maybe on our uh, operations. But I wanted to ask about what that means for the the training, organization, and doctrine of the MAGTAV, uh, operating in that kind of environment, as opposed to the permissive kinds of environments we've been living in in the last. Um, well, really, two, two decades, and, and you've, many of your remarks have already touched on that, but we can start with General Walsh and yeah. work our way down. I'll just, I'll just start with the, uh, as, as General Boudreau said, is the strategy is the most clear strategy that I think in my career since 1989, since the Reagan administration, clear strategy. So the department um, uh, is clearly turned in that direction, so the clear strategy is telling us to move in that direction. So I'll just start with the concepts. Concepts drive where we go. It drive our training, our equipping, our manning, how we organize. So with the clear guidance from the NDS, um, things like littoral operations in a contested environment, <clears throat> signed by the CNO and the Commandant, um, expeditionary advanced base operations that is getting very close to be signed by the uh, Commandant and the CNO, uh, and another one, multi-domain battle that we're working on with the Army uh, is another concept. So the concepts will drive very much where we put our investments, where we exercise to, where we put our war gaming, um, where we put our S&T. And I will tell you from inside uh, my world, that's driving everything we do. The concepts are unifying for both the service with the Army SOCOM on the multi-domain battle side, but certainly the concepts with littoral ops and contested environment uh, and expeditionary advanced base operations are driving everything we're doing within the department all the way down to the operating forces. So I would just start with the concepts is a piece is a major driver. And I would also say that our Marine Corps operating concept that we really signed, the Commandant signed in the fall of 2016, really put us on the route of march down this path looking at higher end conflict. Yeah, so none of this happens overnight, right? So um, where we have been for the last several years, where we asp aspire to down the road or where we're being directed to down the road, uh, while <laughs> certainly Secretary Mattis would like for us to get there more quickly, um, we are incremental, I won't say incremental change, but certainly you, we don't wait for CD&I to hand off a perfectly formed concept before we begin to play with it. So for instance, we're, we are exploring ways to where we can at least tabletop and uh, in, in terrain that is different from what you might immediately identify as an, as an EABO type of environment. How do we do that in other places around the globe? How would that look if we had to do it? Uh, and how might we uh, contest those areas differently than uh, purely a force-on-force -force type of uh, uh, confrontation. So we at, at, at TUMEF, we're trying to find slices of, of these concepts so we can put the work immediately and begin to learn uh, from them now rather than waiting for everything to be perfected. We know that's gonna take some time. 
And it's the same thing with, with the uh, forced presentation. So uh, we're, we, we have a lot of folks on the road around the world in TUMEF doing the nation's bidding. And I would like to have more of them at home preparing them for a higher end confrontation. Uh, we're, we're working on all that, but it's, it doesn't have, I can't just flip a switch and say, okay, everybody come home, we'll retool you for a high end fight and next year we'll be good to go. That's, that's certainly not the way it's gonna happen. It takes a change in mindset, it takes a change in, in culture almost to get refocused on the things that are gonna matter uh, should we have to fight inside the bubble uh, as, a, as an inside force. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the inside force in just a minute. I mean, I think what's recognized in the NDS is that different than in the past, we may have to fight to get to the fight. You know, that the, uh, the idea that we have sea control and air superiority from the get-go is, is an assumption that we're not making anymore. And so when we look at not just EABO, Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations, or the littoral operations in contested environment, from a joint perspective, we're working very closely with the Air Force on their dynamic basing concept, and for the Navy under distributed maritime operations. So when you take the Marine operating concept and start to merge it with the joint concepts, we all recognize that if you can be seen, is, is to be targeted, is to be killed. And so in a place like the Pacific, it's about distribution of your force. It's the ability to rapidly aggregate and mass at the time and place of your choosing when necessary. It's about decoys and deceptions. Uh, it's about low observable properties of, of, of modernization of our equipment. It's, it's all of those things. Um, it's about all domain access and assuring ourselves across all the domains, space, cyber, surface, undersea, land. It's about a MAGTAF that can be a fleet and being that can be a land-based a land MAGTAF to support sea control and asymmetry. It doesn't have to be naval against naval. And we look at the procurement of a naval strike missile or uh, a high mobility artillery rocket system or any kind of multiple rocket system that we might be looking at at extended ranges. We can do things in support of a naval campaign that we haven't been able to do in the past. That's the direction we're moving. You add an unmanned capability into that, an unmanned sensor, an unmanned shooter, a networked force, networked to Aegis systems. Uh, now we're talking about a very sophisticated high-end fight where we need to maintain dominance, first of all, in the information space and dominance over the electromagnetic spectrum. If we can do that, that will underpin everything else that we need to do as a force for command and control, from a ship talking to a land-based system, for, an, for a manned sensor talking, you know, being able to relay through an unmanned sensor back to whatever command and control apparatus might be in charge at the time. To include the incorporation of artificial intelligence into our systems, Watson-like capabilities, where the pace of decision making has to move as quickly as the opportunities reveal themselves. So there will be a lot of machine learning, there will be a lot of, a lot of movement, a lot of investment in, in artificial intelligence. We know that the Chinese have uh, made a lot of investments in that area and, and have some great capabilities. Uh, those are the things that are going to enable this force to be able to fight in a, in a high-end fight. Lastly, on the inside force. So you may see two different MAGTAFs emerging, all of the, within the same Marine Corps. There's, a, there's the constantly forward deployed aspect of the Marine Corps on Navy ships that's going to be inside, inside the adversary's area if they decide to light up their systems one day. We have to be the contact and blunt layer. Someone's got to do the job, and those Marines on amphibious forces, in addition to the rest of the surface Navy or subsurface Navy and air, cyber, uh, is going to deny the adversary the initial capabilities. We will disrupt their plans. We will buy time and space for decision makers in Washington that then can make a decision to be able to surge the force from CONUS. So you're going to see a MAGTAF that's operating inside the, the contact and blunt layer. You're going to see the third layer, the surge force coming in, and of course the fourth layer is homeland defense, uh, more geared toward NORTHCOM, NORAD, NORAD NORTHCOM, ensuring the ballistic missile defense of the United States primarily. So you're going to see a MAGTAF that's operating inside, that has to be survivable and lethal, a disruptive and denying force, and then the rest of the MAGTAF that's coming in from places like Camp Pendleton or Camp Lejeune or Okinawa, assembling at the right place 
to then serve as part of the surge layer, as part of the war winning force that the Army will be deploying. I want to turn to the Navy and uh, the Navy's plan for a 355 ship uh, battle fleet uh, that would build the amphibs, I think, up to 38. Uh, but even 38 isn't enough to meet all of the demands that are put on the amphibious forces, and it's going to take uh, quite some time to, to get there. So I wanted to ask first about the Navy shipbuilding program and the fleet that is developing and how that meets the needs of the MAGTAF uh, and the challenges that uh, may be there. But the second part is uh, asking about the use of auxiliaries and um, non-amphibious ships, particularly as they've done in the Pacific, to meet some of these amphibious demands when there aren't enough amphibious ships to go around. I'll go ahead and uh, start with that. The first thing I would say on the, uh, the, the increase in money that we've got, the funding that we came in uh, 19 with the 7% increase, uh, is certainly the Navy, as you're well aware of, did uh, four, four structure assessments determine that the 355 ships was the right plan. Now, how quickly we can get to that, that requirement is really the challenge and how long is that, uh, that funding going to be consistent. So as, as, if you looked at the 30-year shipbuilding plan, what the CNO's got in there is capacity at our shipyards, where we can increase capacity, um, where we can build more ships if we get more money to accelerate at a faster rate. So that's one of the things that's out there. If Congress can help accelerate that, that uh, that would um, certainly, we'd be fully supportive of that. But we're on a, a path now that we're moving towards uh, our large deck amphibs with our LHA uh, class ship with uh, America, Tripoli uh, coming online now. We've also got our LPDs and our LXR um, coming online in that 30 year ship building plan, all on a pace to get us towards that 38 ship requirement that we're looking for. Um, the last few years prior to this new influx in uh, modernization money we've had, we've been focused very much on the readiness. Uh, and just as General Boudreau said, the Marines have been operating very hard uh, in the CENTCOM AOR, so has those Navy ships. So focusing on readiness, getting the readiness of the ships has been the first focus. Now it's that capacity, the number of ships that we need, and closely behind that is, uh, is part of the equation is the capability on those ships. So when we talk about distributed maritime operations and uh, if it floats, it fights. Part of that is the amphib ships being part of that, not only from a power projection standpoint, but also a sea control standpoint. So when you talk about dynamic force employment, part of it, Mark, is getting to the, how do we use auxiliary ships and different ships in different ways? Uh, I'll just give you one example is out in Fifth Fleet that I thought is very exciting out there. Is out there in uh, Fifth Fleet um, with Task Force 51, we actually have a Marine General that is uh, in charge of that task force. Um, they took the ESB, the Expeditionary Staging Base, um, that chopped into theater and uh, gave it over to the uh, ARGMU. The ARGMU used that along with the EPF, which is a, the joint high-speed vessel or our fast transport, put those two together and put that into the equation with the other uh, naval ships that we've got uh, out there in Fifth Fleet. So that was, I think, the first time that I've really seen an operational commander bring those new auxiliary ships in, whether it's the ESB or the EPF in, and use them in different ways for operational missions in the Fifth Fleet AOR, which I think is a dynamic we're watching very f closely and how that could operate on the Pacific and also uh, the Mediterranean. So I think, I think I'll, I'll carry that auxiliary idea just a little bit further. The, uh, I, I, we should, be very careful how we uh, characterize these ships and how we um, rely on them or how we operationalize them. So we're going to spend a lot of time uh, from, from TUMEF uh, in Norfolk looking at these platforms because uh, it, just because it has a flight deck doesn't necessarily mean that it's capable of doing the things that an amphibious ship uh, can do. So the, the options that it gives you is the exciting part, I think and the opportunities that are, that are available when you have more options are always a good thing. Uh, 
but I would be careful not to characterize uh, th these ships as m more than they are or less than they are, for that matter. The, any time that you can spend uh, time with our Navy brothers and sisters and learn more about their platforms and their capabilities is always good. And I would, I would kind of complete my remarks in this particular piece about relationships. That, that is the strongest part of, I think, uh, this current um, time that we're in, is that the, the relationships with our Navy uh, brothers and sisters in, uh, in Norfolk have not been better uh, in a long, long time, and we're looking forward to continuing that. Uh, they really do have an operational mindset, and they want to uh, enable the Naval Force. So uh, given the, the things that General Walsh just talked about with funding, a plan, and some options, we, again, uh, look at great opportunity going forward. So it seems that with a 355 ship Navy that um, we have a hard time breaking about a 10% threshold for amphibs relative to the size of the fleet. Moving toward a 600 ship Navy, we had 62 amphibs, we're at 355, we're moving toward with 38 amphibs. So I'm confident we'll get there. And then it's a matter of uh, what's on them. We need to build amphibs in the future differently than we have built them in the past. We can't always count that there's going to be a number of destroyers and cruisers to escort amphibs or to tuck in. So those warships in and of themselves need to have, you know, what kind of defensive systems and offensive systems, vertical launch systems, for instance, that we may need to place on them in the future that we don't have today, I think is important uh, to make sure that they have resilient command and control systems on board, that they, that they have all of that's required to be part of the, net, the larger network force. So, Everything from C2 to fires, the defensive systems is something that we'll look at. The auxiliaries are necessary but not preferred, right? An amphib gives you more capability than an auxiliary does. But out of necessity, based on the number of amphibs we have today and the demands of training for a higher end fight, we, we use the auxiliaries. But best suited for a low end operation than high end war fighting. They're great platforms for staging a force to do uh, to, you know, countering violent extremists. They're wonderful for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or perhaps even to have a force to go execute a NEO and to bring some evacuees back aboard for some period of time. But they are not an LPD or an LHA. And, and we recognize that, but we're going to take every advantage we can of the training opportunities allowed for them, which could be command and control, you know, helleborne operations, uh, and in some ways uh, looking at our connectors that, that operate with these ships. Um, so I think the other part that we haven't really talked about beyond just auxiliaries and, and the L class is what do Marines do differently aboard cruisers and destroyers? What, what capabilities can we put aboard an LCS that we haven't fully explored? If we go with small craft and get some small craft on destroyers and, and cruisers, there's some capability we can put on those. Not, not always high end, but again, just enough to give the adversary something different to think about when they see Marines on the deck of a ship that they're not used to seeing in the past. So we're going to get creative with everything that floats um, and continue to explore and innovate with the Navy in any way we can. Uh, I, I agree completely with uh, what the other three have said. I think it's uh, certainly in the work, all the work that I've done on amphibs, it's the combination of the command and control and the fires and the transport capability in one platform um, that you can get bits and pieces of in other platforms, but uh, that unique combination uh, has it has a unique role to play. So uh, I think the Navy's commitment to distributed maritime operations uh, goes exactly where General Boudreaux was talking about, thinking about uh, how you optimize across the fleet uh, those responsibilities and the flexibility that you can get in those roles as, in theory, the network gets built out and the fleet gets built out. Uh, implies a lot of change for both forces and, and thinking about uh, how they can really get the most leverage out of the full capabilities that they offer. I, I would also say I, that uh, another major component of this is, is the increase in naval capacity around the world, right? Uh, other navies are growing, many of our friends are growing their navies substantially in response to the same challenges that we see. Um, 
and I was able to do a couple, uh, some work a couple of years ago with the Australians uh, as they started building amphibs. Um, not, but it, so, so there are lots of opportunities for other platforms as well um, that I think can bring real synergies um, with our Marine Corps. So, um, I, and I know the Corps is looking hard at that stuff as well. Great. Let me ask uh, one last question, which is about uh, modernization and acquisition. When many people think about innovation in MAGTAFs, they think about um, new systems. Uh, as the panelists have indicated, that's really much too narrow a way to think about it, but it is an important uh, component. Uh, new weapons, new uh, uh, systems that are coming into the, uh, into the fleet, into the MAGTAF. And I was wondering if um, panelists might want to comment about you know, what's going to be in the MAGTAF of the future. I guess I'll, I'll just start with the priorities that we had been, uh, and certainly 19 that are carrying forward really as we start to build out in uh, 20. Um, if you look at the Marine Corps operating concept, the first thing we really focused on a lot of that is on the information warfare side. That was, that was uh, so when it comes to funding, that's been our priority. That's where we see our advantage of operating in all domains. The Marine Corps is a maneuver force. Uh, we try to maneuver in all domains, and as we look at information warfare, we see lots of advantages that we see in that area. So a good bit of our funding increase has gone into areas like signals intelligence, electronic warfare, our command and control capability, how do we operate in a degraded um, area. So IW, along with our organizational change, our big organizational change that we did in that area was standing up, uh, as General Hedlund will uh, talk, on the uh, MEF information groups. So it's not only to put equipping in there in modernization, but we changed the organization significantly to move in that, uh, in that new operating concept. Our long range precision fires trying to increase the range of just about everything we have. When it comes down to our cannon artillery, uh, to our, our high Mars uh, rocket systems, I'm looking at everything from a near term, mid term, and long term perspective. In that near term, some of the capabilities that we're lacking, we're looking at like an air defense capability or a long range anti ship missile capability, going out and procuring something right now that's available right now that we can integrate into our command and control system. Uh, a lot of cases like we've got with our uh, Gator radar uh, and our uh, command and, common aviation command and control systems, we've got fifth generation sensors out there that we have right now. That's the good news when we start talking about integrating into the joint force. We've got systems like that. We don't have the sh uh, shooters that we need from an air defense camp standpoint or anti-ship long range capability. So those are things that we're going to focus on in there. Uh, air defense being our third priority. Uh, C2 in a degraded environment is where we're putting investment and how uh, formations of the future, and we see the intellectual capital that we have with our Marines, uh, our, our high-end capability by tying that together with technology is where our real advantage is. And that advantage is allows them to operate in sometimes in autonomous and independent, more independent manner than they've ever operated in before. So it could be a reconnaissance unit out there and maybe its flanks aren't protected, but it's got the capability to maneuver on its own, to sense the battle space on its own. So things like our advanced reconnaissance vehicle that we're now putting money into in this uh, palm to be able to vent, uh, develop what the next reconnaissance vehicle is gonna be in the future. And then finally, our ability to uh, conduct protected, uh, protected mobility and enhanced maneuver. Um, and how do we get it things like active protection systems, vehicle protection systems, just like the aircraft have today on our fifth generation systems we've got on our aircraft. We need those type of capabilities to enhance maneuver and enhance our protection of our mobility systems. So I would uh, say that those are the capabilities that we're really going after uh, in the defense budget. Uh, just this year in 19, um, we got a 7% increase in funding and we increased our modernization accounts by 32%. So the money does show where our investments are going, and a lot of it is all going towards the information warfare area, uh, long-range precision fires, enhancing our ability to maneuver, and certainly in our C2 capabilities. So a little, little bit more about the MIG uh, and the, uh, the proximity of Camp Lejeune to both Quantico and to DC is helpful in that we get to play with some of the toys uh, quite often that are uh, being discovered out there and, and in events like uh, Bold Alligator, we get after experimentation. Uh, I invite experimentation into all of our exercises to ensure that we have a chance to, to put some of these 
ideas to work. Uh, but for the MIG, for those not so steeped in uh, Marine Corps organizational structure, uh, the MEF had previously a, a headquarters group that provided enablers and other capabilities to MAGTAFs once they are put together and begin to train and, and work together. So when they go down range, they have everything they need. The, the transition to the, the MEF information group still retains most of those enabling capabilities, but also adds an information component that's, that's pretty important. And what we've begun to, uh, to sort out now through a couple of exercises and uh, kind of day-to-day -day, uh, learning is that you, you can't take a lethal capability and a non-lethal capability and expect them to play well with each other uh, by uh, just by being in close proximity. The planning that goes into uh, an information environment uh, that is lethal to adversaries and is uh, protective of those we want to protect has to be built from the ground up. It's got to be baked in, uh, sewn into the fabric, not, not added as icing uh, at the end of the day. And we have, uh, we're looking forward to opportunities coming up in the fall to, to continue to build on this on this work. Uh, well, for just one small example is signature management. We're going to be doing a, a signature management uh, war game as the uh, fall approaches that is really work that uh, it, we used to be pretty good at signature management uh, when the threats that we were uh, up against in the, in the Cold War were real. We have been, uh, I wouldn't say lazy, but we certainly have not had to worry about that as much uh, in recent years. Now, uh, signature management is going to be a big deal. So relearning or coming up with new techniques in order to manage our signature, both on the battlefield, at sea, in the air, et cetera, is, uh, is a, an important part of what the expertise in, in the MIG will be able to help us with uh, going, going forward. Maybe just to, the last parts on this one. The, uh, any technology uh, has got to be sustainable. Uh, we have some exquisite equipment that we need to make sure that the parts are there, the spares are there, we can maintain it. Um, and it's about the people at the end of the day. It's always about the people who put that technology into action. And then what are the training programs? How long are the training programs? We know how long it takes to develop a cyber warrior. We have clearance requirements, there's backlogs in clearance, you know, getting people cleared to get into those jobs so we can get them into the training. Um, but the capabilities is coming. There's a couple things that we're looking at that General Walsh uh, had within his subsets of uh, priorities. One of those would be a, an armed UAS that's operating from a ship. There's all kinds of armed UASs today, but very few that effectively could operate from a ship. So we're, we're pursuing some technology in that way. And then a the real focus effort in uh, the rest of 18 and into 19 will be logistics modernization. If we have this concept of expeditionary advanced bases across widely distributed areas, how do we sustain that force? What do we have today in terms of logistics distribution uh, and what do we need for the future? You know, how do we get there? What's going to be manned? What's going to be unmanned? What type of surface connectors are going to move logistics in which ways? At what volume? Tremendous asset coming to the fleet is going to be the, be the CH-53 Kilo, uh, an incredible machine that can lift 91,000 pounds gross weight, that can lift loads up, upwards and in, in probably in excess of 36,000 pounds. It can hit three separate independent zones because it's got three, three independent sling loads that can, that can resupply and sustain at over 12,000 pounds each. That's ammunition, that's fuel, that's, you know, whatever we need. So that's just one piece of several things that we're looking at and are already in development to help us get through the logistic challenges of, of resupplying and sustaining, quickly setting up, breaking down, and relocating these forces that we'll have at these various advanced bases. Some may be up for 24 hours, break down and move, or 72 hours, break down and move. So that, again, that operational unpredictability is, is how we're building this, and uh, we, need a log, we need a log system that can support the concept. Okay, and to wrap this last question up, I'm going to ask Marin, who's worked at the OSD level and in the think tanks, what should the Marine Corps be thinking more about? Um, so I think uh, I completely agree with the general themes that the generals have talked about this morning. I, in my mind, the 
focus on information warfare and the um, and the spectrum uh, spectrum warfare is um, I think overdue and and well warranted and uh, so I think that's that's sort of the critical um, enabling capability that has to be considered and so I, I don't think there's um, I don't think they're not thinking about the right things. Um, the fun, I think the, the Marine Corps faces some fundamental challenges in that while you're able to leverage the, big, the other services, more significant S&T investments and things like that, that, that also hems you in to a certain extent, that you don't have uh, a, a lot of money to go pursue new capabilities, significant new capabilities uh, in the ways that, that the other larger services do. Uh, I also think you're inherently dependent on the others so that you can come up with great concepts. I think one of the challenges the Marine Corps has had is that they've had a lot of good concepts and they haven't had as much of an impact on the POM as they might have if you'd been one of the bigger services. So uh, within the constraints that you face, uh, I, think, I think the focus is in the right areas. Um, I would also say that the MAGTAF arguably is, is relatively unchanged uh, for some number of decades. <laughs> you, people can debate how many decades you want to put into that, uh, what you want X to be, but it's a lot, uh, I think. And so I, to me, there's a fundamental question about is that, uh, is that being explored fully enough? Um, and again, I think given the dependence on the other services, I'm not sure a more, a broader investigation would get you anywhere differently necessarily. Um, I do think there's a general consensus among the services about the problems and the challenges and the, and the real question will be, can you uh, collectively come up with joint answers and program to them? Um, and you know, I guess we'll see the proofs will be in the pudding, so. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up now to your questions. I'd ask that you wait for a microphone to come down to you, and I would also ask that there be a question mark at the end of your question. <laughs> Admiral, as our co-host, you get the first question. Hi, Pete Daly, Naval Institute. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to ask this question. Do we run a risk if we go to uh, this dynamic force employment and uh, General Bujalt said, you know, we're going to have a MAGTAF forward doing the everyday things that we've come to expect and then maybe a more higher end group back home that's been able to train to a higher level. Do we run the risk that we're going to have to compete for uh, assets to move those Marines and be more dependent on fixed bases or at least land bases forward under that concept and does that blur the brand? Thanks for the question, Admiral. I would say no. Um, I don't think we're going to have to wait on lift because the dynamic force employment of Marines will be tied to the Navy. Um, the global force management decisions, how forces get allocated around the globe is being looked at as we speak between the chairman and the secretary, what that looks like now and in the future. Um, in terms of the drivers will be the readiness of those forces. Back in the, back in the US, in those that are forward deployed, we know are already our most ready. So the, the, the key is combat credibility. Are they combat credible? We have all kinds of Marines that are forward deployed, but a small unit in South America, for instance, that's doing theater security cooperation as a platoon level is not really combat credible. They're there for a specific reason and purpose. However, we might have two MUs afloat in the Western Pacific. You might have the third, 31st MU, and you might have a West Coast MU that together can combine with a command and control arrangement out of Okinawa that's a MEB headquarters that could go over the top very quickly, aggregate, and now you've got a significant combat credible force to do part of this dynamic force employment that I mentioned. So it's about readiness. It's about readiness of the forces in CONUS that may go forward, and it's about combat credibility of the formation. Okay, uh, Sydney. Hi, do you mind standing up? Sure. 
Hi, uh, gentlemen, Ms. Lee. Sidney Friedberg from Breaking Defense. Uh, a qu question that comes up to mind that, you know, you said, you know, there would be a difference between the surge force and the blunt contact force. Uh, the blunt contact force will be, you know, able to operate when it sort of, when the balloon goes up, as it were. Uh, but it strikes me that there you know, might be, as Admiral Daly hinted at, a sort of an emerging bifurcation between, you know, the CONUS based uh, surge marine force and, you know, the patrolling marine force, the cop on the block, as it were, and then perhaps even a three-way bifurcation with, you know, those guys on the Hatter missions operating off auxiliary ships who might not have the same level of hardware or, or mass. You know, to what degree are you, you know, creating different flavors of marine, of, of MAGTAF? We already have special purpose MAGTAFs. To what degree can you sort of retain some of the interchangeability you have now? My simple question. <laughs> so, uh, uh, not, not to try and um, make this too simple because it's not. Uh, you know, the Marine Corps is a, is a one MCO force. So if something breaks uh, around the world, the forces you describe are, are the ones who are going to go. So for instance, um, you know, in, the, in the Korean theater, there are forces that have, that have trained specifically uh, for that mission. There are forces at Camp Lejeune today that if it really comes to a full-blown um, conflict, have not trained uh, specifically for that, for that mission. Now they have obviously done very well at training to the core METs, the core essential tasks that are within their mission, but they may not be as steeped uh, in the knowledge of the peninsula as, as the ones who work there every day in 3MEF. Same goes for that force that is uh, almost every conflict I can think of in recent history that the Marine Corps has been associated with. We did windows on the way to or on the way back from the conflict. So whether it was Desert Storm, uh, it seemed like Liberia was always a, a, a stopping point on the way to or on the way back from uh, a conflict that was a little more serious. Uh, so I, I, I agree that the perfect uh, solution would be that those three forces that you that you describe all know each other, have trained together, have had the opportunity to do combined arms together, et cetera. That's that's optimum. We don't always have that uh, luxury, I think. So again, things like a well-known operating concept that has been tried out and uh, and exercised with and experimented with across the force uh, is valuable, and then. If you are, uh, if you have to put these forces together to do it, you have at least got a common ground to work from, uh, with the uh, with the knowledge that being able to do that with the exact forces who might be called to do it is is going to be very very difficult. I don't know if that that may need some embellishment, if you will, from from the other panel members. So the only thing I'd, I'd like to add on to that is it, it's really a matter of training focus, and it it, it does very much get to the forward deployed force who is on its assigned mission, and it might be uh, focused on CT support. It might be afloat to do personnel recovery, quick reaction force, primary missions, but it's gonna be combat credible. But it might be a Marine Expeditionary Unit, which in and of itself is, is, may not be enough to do what's necessary. So really, the, it gets to the training focus, and the training focus of those back at home versus those four deployed should be on major combat operations fighting at the MEF level or at least a MEB level and higher. Uh, that's a different kind of training workup for folks in CONUS than it is for a Marine Expeditionary Unit that's getting ready to go and do 19 different things in support of a combatant commander. So really it's, and it's, when we talk about the surge force, we can't just think about the Marine Corps or the Navy itself. This is a joint. You're talking that the nation is going to go to war. Probably if, the, if we're surging from the homeland, it's not just Marines that are surging on amphibs to go forward. You're, there's going to be bomber presence. There will be, there will be Army units mobilizing. Who knows if it requires a, re, a reserve mobilization or not. Depends on what the, uh, you know, what the crisis is of the day. That, that, but this is much bigger. So where does the Marine Corps formation also fit in to the larger campaign that's being put together in terms of a joint effort? Uh, that's the level of capability we're talking about is a, is a larger Marine Corps that's able to plug back into a larger joint fight. 
and I think that tension that I think both questions alluded to is the one that I uh, tried to tried to raise in, in, at the beginning of the session. I, in my mind, the other implication of that is that that contact and blunt force has to be able to leverage uh, the other elements of the joint force that are also there, and there will likely be some. Uh, so how do you do that to the maximum extent? And then at, depending on geography, that's going to vary. And then the partners, wherever that may be. So I think it's a very, uh, it's a different way of thinking about uh, where if there's a, I won't call it a gap, but a, uh, if there's a, 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 a greater seam between uh, forward and surge, um, or at least a different nature of a seam between forward and surge, what does that imply for the seams that we've allowed to persist, at least to some degree, within that forward force? Uh, how do we knit those together more closely to help? Because the faster that contact and blunt force can uh, be effective, the quicker the surge forces can reinforce. So uh, I think it's just a, it's a different way of, it just requires a slightly different lens, but not fundamentally different. Uh, but I think we have to think our way through that. Another question? Oh, okay, right there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Veronica Cartier. I'm a think tank focused on nuclear policy and strategic defense issues. Uh, most recently, um, as a matter of fact, it's last month, May 24, National Defense uh, Authorization Act. There are three provisions in maritime defense. Uh, I will quote it as that a mandate, a new program to develop boost phase intercept capability, including kinetic interceptor, while continuing previous efforts to develop directed energy solutions. So my question is how important it is, how crucial it is, technology and strategic speaking, this program. Would you please elaborate that? Thank you so much. I'll just start on that. I mean, certainly it's not an area to directly for the Marine Corps on that, but what I would say is when you get into um, great power competition, you have to have a credible force. So as you look across, you know, today we're just focused on our, our piece of that, but to, for a national capability, you have to have a critical, credible capability. So looking at the nuclear force, uh, we haven't been putting a lot of effort or a lot of funding into that for many, many years. So to have a credible combat deterrent capability, you have to have a credible nuclear capability. So looking at that capability, along with things like directed energy weapons, which could be applicable across strategic all the way to operational tactical, all those capabilities will come into play, but it's, it's things that we have not put in our resources against because, as General Boudreau said, we had not been focused on any type of strategic competition or threat. The threat is driving us to new capabilities that we haven't looked at in a long time. So as we looked at our conventional training that we've got to increase that against a higher end capability, so also do we have to do with our nuclear capabilities. Brian, I don't know if you want to touch on any more on that no, from your side. I think you're referencing space, is that correct, on the, uh, in, inside the NDA? And I'll just say that there is a, goes to the strategic investment we're making. Some comes off the top from every service to be able to pay for the common good. Um, I won't get into any of the, any of the things that we're, we're looking at, but suffice to say, it's really been a recognition just in the last couple of years that, war, that, that space is now a war fighting domain and we need to protect our assets that are up there and we have to be cognizant of what the adversary has and can do. We have to look at what commercially available uh, things are, can, can augment uh, you know, our own efforts that are up there, but it's, it's got the laser focus, the United States Air Force and a whole bunch of people right now. And, uh, and the, I'll tell you the investments will be well made and um, I'll, just, I'll just stop there. But the fact that we've recognized it as a war fighting domain and not just, you know, that everything is going to be peaceful in space in terms of exploration. Uh, I think those days are behind us in terms of assuring our, our ability to operate. Sure, sure. 
Good morning, uh, Paul Danfus from uh, SES Government Solutions, and that was a that was a great segue into into my question, sir, uh, to kind of build on um, on space a, a little bit. Um, space is not only a a war fighting domain, but in the last few years, since about 2011, we've recognized that it's competitive, it's uh, congested, it's contested. So with that. Um, where my, my field is, is in uh, uh, commercial satellite communications. There are a lot of commercial systems that are coming online that are in geosynchronous, but in, we're starting to look at other orbits. And in the case of our company, we've already got a constellation in medium Earth orbit. So with low Earth orbit, with medium Earth orbit, the systems are inherently more resilient to both kinetic attacks, to, to jamming, things of that nature. So my question is um, um, just some thoughts on incorporating that into the MAGTAF, incorporating that from, for ship-to-shore uh, communications. Marine Corps is really good at recognizing that space is a contested environment, um, but some of these new systems will help us, help us work through that. Thank you. Thanks. I guess I would just say, is, as, you know, across the Joint Force, we're looking at that, you know, so one of our top modernization priorities I talked about was C2, command and control in a degraded environment. So as we're looking at space, and just as General Boudreau said, is it's going to be contested. So if it's going to be contested or potentially you've got uh, a small number of military satellites, relatively so, the way to become more resilient than that is to leverage commercial capability or put lots more of them up there. Or the other things that we're looking real hard at doing or we're currently doing is developing mesh networks of our own capabilities. So I think all of those things are players in what we're doing is we can't rely on the current structure. We've got to move in a new direction. And a lot of that is, is in space, there's a lot of opportunities there. And I think a lot of the smaller commercial satellites, to be able to leverage them, to move on and off those, uh, along with being able to put up more smaller satellites ourselves. Um, and a lot of the technologies that we're putting up, we can use with balloon capabilities, things like that, that we can put up for long duration that are able to mesh net the capabilities we currently have. By, you know, by chance, I had an opportunity to talk with General Bolden obviously former NASA, NASA astronaut, just Saturday night about the manner in which the commercial space industry is just taking off right now. So it's, it's hard to envision today what may be available even three and five years of where SpaceX and others are, are, are going to take us. Um, and then part of this is a training issue, right? So if we do lose our ability to have satellite communications or something along those lines, then is the force prepared for that? Do we, do we force a unit to operate in a degraded environment and, and figure out what the workarounds are, be it mesh networks or a loss of PNT or, you know, how do, we, how do we work around those things? And so some of this is inducing friction into our training and, and try to overcome it and have a better realization of how dependent we are or not in, in some areas and is there manual or, you know, there's still some use of radios and manual workarounds, and are, are we comfortable kind of flexing back to that if we have to? Okay, now on the end there. Thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you all. Uh, I'm Griffin Cannon. I had a question about, um, you mentioned multi-domain battle earlier, and I'm wondering uh, just about that inside force, the joint force. Uh, what role the Army plays in that, uh, in that inside blunting force. Um, thank you. Um, well, I would say is, I find it interesting because we're, we're working with the concepts that we're working on with the Navy. Um, and when I take that across the multi-domain battle with the Army, a lot of the concepts for those concepts of employment cross both. They're almost identical. One may be in the maritime domain, one may be more in the land domain. Um, but I think as, as you look at that, what we're trying to do is, again, is try to have those ability to maneuver where and when we want, be able to have overmatch where and when we want, and it may be more in a much more distributed fashion than we have today. So our work with the Army in that is we may be that contact or blunt force as we envision it, um, but they're going to be right there with us in many cases because they bring a lot of joint capabilities that, that we wouldn't have, and you're going to be right there. But how do we enable them to come in um, more quickly and interface with us? So again, as you start to drive to joint concepts, 
uh, and you start to develop things like multi-domain battle, it really is uh, bringing in a lot of the, the joint staff we're br now bringing in to make this more of a joint capability on how all these different services capabilities come together. Okay, third try. Gentlemen on the end of the second row there. Good morning, Otto Kreischer, Sea Power Magazine. Uh, the Corps is doing a lot of reorganizing, start at the lower level, you're, what you're doing with the infantry squads, higher level with the, um, the MAGTAG in, information groups, that sort of thing. But facing the kind of inside ops, uh, distributed ops, and other things you're going to work into, are you looking at other reorganizations of your MAGTAF? Do you have to ch change the kind of units that you're going to be ready to deploy? You know, we did, you know, the Corps did the uh, experiment with the company landing teams rather than working on battalion. Uh, f for those kind of inside ops, you know, with low visibility, are you going to have to look at smaller or, or different organizi organizational levels for your MAGTAFs? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that one. I think uh, the comment earlier about the MAGTAF hadn't changed. Uh, in many decades is only part of the story. Uh, the, MAGTAF, the MAGTAFs that we deploy and eventually employ, they're constantly evolving. Uh, the, the Marine Expeditionary Unit of today is not the Marine Expeditionary Unit or Marine Amphibious Unit of the past. Uh, the capabilities that they have with them, uh, information, operations, uh, intelligence, signals, intelligence, all, all, all the, um, at, at the appropriate level and the appropriate mix, um, changes each deployment because the world changes each deployment. So I think that's one thing that's important. The, the other part of that is that we, we do believe that how we task organize these other um, concepts where is EABO, that it, is it is it can be as almost as big or as small as you can envision it uh, to to accomplish a certain mission. So what are Marines going to do? They're going to task organize to accomplish that that mission. The uh, we we can't kill uh, you know all the bugs with a sledgehammer. You know we have to have, be a little bit more uh, precision and uh, more specific about how we get after certain problems. So I think that. It, as we always have done, we'll experiment with different organizational structures in order to see which one might be best able to get after a, a particular mission. But we rely heavily on the the tactical commander, the guy or gal that's down there on the on the leading edge to put together the right team to do the right job for the right reason. And and that should not be wed to any specific line and block chart. The lady at the uh, end of the first row there. Thank you. Megan Eckstein, USNI News. Um, actually, I have a related question. Uh, so within the context of uh, dynamic force employment, um, we've heard a lot about new technologies being pushed down to lower levels of the Marine Corps organization, whether it's unmanned or information warfare. Um, but I was wondering if you're also seeing where specific mission sets are being pushed down. Um, I guess another way of asking is, you know, can platoons and companies uh, use that technology to do their old missions better, or are they also using that technology to take on new missions that they couldn't do at that level before? I don't know about new missions. It's, it's new methods to execute many of the same missions. At the end of the day, for an infantryman, it's about locating, closing with, and destroying the enemy. Now, how we, how we find them and how we close with what we close, it may not be a human at all that closes on that enemy. It may not be a human that even sees that enemy. But there's, there's something that's going to locate, there's something that's going to close with, and there's something that has an ability to finish or repel his assault by fire in close combat thus getting into the close combat lethality task force of the types of things that we're going to enable those Marines and soldiers and special operators to have and cross-pollinate all the good TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures that go with that to include the cognitive skills of those individuals. So I don't know if the mission changes, but, but the manner in which we can execute that mission at less cost to the human is, uh, is really what we're after. I can give you I guess, two um, examples that are maybe a little bit different. Um, we had um, 
trying to give our, our infantry more capabilities in electronic magnetic spectrum. So just recently in our advanced, uh, our fifth generation urban advanced naval technology experiment, we gave uh, Kilo, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, a lot of ESM and electronic attack capability. Um, and what we noticed with them was they absorbed it very quickly. It was a new mission for them. This would be normally something even back in the Cold War when we had a lot of, a lot of electronic attack capabilities, uh, it would have been to a specific unit that conducted that mission for them. Uh, in this case, we pushed that down to the infantry marines um, and they used it incredibly different than I could ever have imagined on how they embraced the technology uh, and used it where they were in fact maneuvering in electronic magnetic spectrum. As I listened to them and watched them operate, they were operating non-kinetically. We start talking about putting up RF walls at different phase lines. Uh, this was not something I'd seen infantry do in the past, but given the capability, they took a tool, put it into a task organized unit, and used it effectively. So that was down at the small unit level. Um, kind of go back a little bit to Otto's question, though, on are we organizing differently? Which, uh, kind of reverse. On the MLG side uh, in Marine Corps Force 2025, we had really, uh, in, over the years, become more decentralized with more direct capability down, uh, detached units down to lower levels. We've kind of actually brought that more back and gotten more functionally organized in a marine logistics group, back to our more the way we did things in the past, some ways maybe a little bit the way the air combat element does it with our maintenance supply and transportation battalions. So that was almost kind of a reversal back to functionally organize ourselves and be able to push those detachments back down, which is a lot of the way that we're going to be doing it into the MEF information group. If you look at that MEF information group, uh, a new domain, new capability, I'd look at it a lot more like our air officers, our JTACs, our facts that are down at lower levels, be able to augment those capabilities in a higher end um, with the electronic magnetic spectrum and EW capabilities they'll be bringing. Okay, um, let's see, we'll go to the back there. One of our own here. <laughs> Good morning, Captain Tom Ulmer. I'm a fellow here at uh, CSIS and also with the Naval Institute. There have been a lot of discussions between the Navy and the Marine Corps about the 10th ARG, moving it to the East Coast, specifically to Mayport. Uh, where are those discussions? If, and if uh, a 10th ARG is not moved, what uh, risk does that bring to 2 MAF and to the Marine Corps in its employment and operations? What are you doing to possibly mitigate those? So the discussions on the uh, on the tenth arc specifically, I I think is 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 going to be there is a, a common desire to do it. Uh, it's the year in which we can execute is what's up for maybe even further discussion. Um, we wanted to start sooner. There are valid reasons that the United States Navy would like to maybe postpone that out uh, by a few years. So I think that's kind of where it is, is that it, uh, we want to get the lay down, the, you know, we want to do it in conjunction with the Navy's overarching plan within their strategic lay down. I think that's probably not going to happen within the next year or two. But the idea of why we want to do it, which would actually increase presence and actually close, reduce the number of days required to aggregate a force in, against any one of our major plans uh, is, is there. So. Uh, without waffling too much on that question, it's, it, it really, I think we finally have a, an agreement between the Commandant and the CNO that, you know, yes, we'd like to do it. It's, it's just probably going to, realistically, it's probably going to have to wait a couple of years on the 10th arc specifically. Could you, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. In the meantime, what are the mitigations that uh, you're taking to, uh, for force employment and for operations in the gap that's yeah, I think it's constantly evolving, and so it was, it was really driven by trying to posture the force and, and get the, the optimal, you know, the optimum amount of trans-regional uh, effectiveness from any single deployment or where we might want to put it, say the Eastern Med. We know that you, could, you can service, med, you know, UCOM, AFRICOM, and CENTCOM from, from the Eastern Med. Well, I think we're going to be able to do that just based on where we're heading on dynamic force employment and what's already being regularly scheduled through the global force management process. So at the end of the day, uh, though we would like to see the yard come to the East Coast, in effect, we'll, we'll get much of it just based on 
uh, what GFM portends and, and what the Secretary is thinking about on, on dynamic force employment. So not a lot of additional risk being accepted or anything like that because it's not going to happen immediately. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, the lady there who got her hand up first. Good morning, Leah Hurley with Booz Allen. We've talked a lot about multiple aspects that are changing. Do you as leaders feel that the department's current readiness metrics serve you well with all of this change, or do you think that they need to evolve and modernize as well? Uh, well, I think first, uh, we like the current trend in our readiness profile across the board. Uh, it's taken us a while, um, but both aviation, ground equipment, et cetera, personnel, it's going in the right direction. Um, as far as as far as the metrics that uh, whether or not they are um, useful and and uh, helpful in the way we describe our readiness posture, I, I, there are there are challenges with any snapshot of readiness. Um, the, you know, literally, a, the 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 change of a flag from one hand to the other can change your readiness profile. Uh, you know, from one day to another and, and move your readiness needle, if you will, in a, in, a, in a direction that may be good or bad. So I think if we, if we are going to um, entertain readiness metrics or readiness reporting or readiness uh, discussions, we have to acknowledge that it's the, it's, the, it's the commander's assessments piece of that that we really need to pay attention to. Uh, the overtime trends and uh, what that communicates to the institution about need. So is, if, if I have, as an operational commander, if I have the confidence that the, my readiness reporting is being received and acted upon by the institution, then I'm pretty happy with that readiness reporting regime. Um, it, it, the point at which that no longer helps me communicate my readiness concerns then, then we need to talk about uh, whether or not we need to change it. I know at the, at the service level and above, there, there's lots of um, potential concern or, or challenges with readiness reporting, but from our perspective, it's the discussion that it generates that is really important at the MEF. My opportunity to engage with my commanders about where the readiness is, is one thing. Where it's going and why it's going in the direction that it's going is really the, the more important discussion. So as the, as the guy who's responsible to the Commandant and ultimately the Commandant to the Secretary of Defense for readiness of the Marine Corps, in our reporting, I, I, my view is it's been very, very collaborative with OSD, particularly working with DepSec Def Shanahan um, and how the needle is moving based on the funding that we're receiving. We had, we had a lot of say in, in, in the metric that's been in, you know, viewed for the Marine Corps in terms of what are our, uh, kind of what are the, uh, some of the obstacles that are out there that need to be leapt over in, in terms of where do we want to apply the funding to move the needle in readiness. We've had a lot of say in that. And then once we've made the declaration of here's the best way that we can use the funding the department has given us to enhance our readiness, then we're accountable to that. You know, so it's been very, I think it's been very collaborative, it's been very fair, and we've had a huge say, whether it's moving the needle on aviation readiness or preparation for uh, major combat operations or, uh, <clears throat> how our major defense acquisition programs are, are going in, a, you know, in accordance with the funding that's there and are we on schedule, on, et cetera, and on cost. So we've got, uh, I think it's been, been very collaborative. I have no issue. I think they've got the right metrics. Why? Because I think we've had a huge say in, in what those metrics are. Okay, before we break, Marin has encouraged me to allow one last question from one of the midshipmen who have been patiently waiting. So I believe the midshipman in the middle has been trying to get his question in, a quick question and then we'll break. Uh, Midshipman First Class Program, a member of the Naval Institute's internship program. I actually have a picture from a current, a uh, question rather, from a currently forward deployed Marine who's watching it on the live stream. So I apologize, I'm reading off the phone here. Um, where do you see the future of land-based special purpose mag tasks like those poised for crisis response in CENTCOM and AFRICOM, who while staged as quick reaction forces often end up becoming a menu of capabilities that are picked apart and end up being take on to adjacent forces, thus degrading the inherent mag -tap aspects of the unit? <laughs> Is it realistic to try and maintain the whole mag units in these four deployed land-based environments? 
<laughs> Sorry for a complicated one. I planted that question. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, that that really is um, a great question that was covered broadly earlier on about um, how we how we deploy the force, how we posture the force, how we prepare the force, and then what for. And I would I would say that uh, at the time, the idea that we would need uh, a special purpose MAGTAF for a particular part of the planet in order to tackle problems. Uh, is was absolutely, and to this day, still fulfills a great uh, capability and function for the COCOM uh, that it happens to be uh, allocated to. So I, they have, uh, we have over time, again, kind of evolved those special purpose MAGTAFs to be more fine-tuned to what they were really uh, assigned to do with a very keen eye toward guarding against mission creep. You know, the, the point at which you have de uh, prepared and deployed a force for somebody else's use and the mission begins to change, you're always going to be a little disappointed with uh, what the end result is, either from a readiness perspective or from just what that, what that unit is really doing. So uh, I, I think that as long as they are useful to the nation and as long as the Marine Corps is able to put them out, then, then they're important. Now, if you look at the NDS and the NSS, those types of things are being de-emphasized. So if I need to recoup uh, equipment, aircraft, and people in order to build readiness for uh, a higher priority mission in the NDS and the NSS, those special purpose MAGTAFs are a place I'm gonna go and begin to talk about how do we get those back and prepare it a, a different force for a different conflict or a different crisis. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and we're wrapping up, a, oh, I'll go add ahead. one thing on what Mark. So that we have three. Right? We have one that we put down in South America during the storm season, primarily different purpose, organized differently, different focus in its training. The one in the Central Command region, organized and equipped differently, different focus. And then the one that we have in Europe, uh, support in Africa, is also different in its own right in terms of organization and focus in its own challenges uh, in terms of time distance. But primarily, it, and it just, I just want to reinforce the point that General Hedlund had is that, yes, we work these elements up. Uh, I would say the one down in South America is not designed to be combat credible. It's down there for humanitarian purposes primarily and for theater security engagement. The one in the Central Command region is combat credible. The one in the uh, in Europe is also combat credible, but would need some augmentation from, from the joint force in terms of fixed wing support, for instance. Uh, and then it's the real world. So the idea that we would need to em employ it in total is, would be desirable, but then the real world gets in the way of having to really provide small elements and detachments to soft to protect U.S. personnel and facilities. And they are making an enormous difference in both, well, really in all three locations, the one just got down to South America recently, but the one in the Central Command region has been incredibly and vitally important to the, to the execution of Operation Inherent Resolve. Conversely, the, the, to ensure we have, don't have any additional Benghazis and to support the soft that we've had working throughout the AFRICOM region, vitally, vitally important in addition to our Navy partner who's been, uh, who's been supporting with an LPD up there for some time. So uh, there's the ideal and then there's the real, and the real has been of tremendous value to the nation and to those combatant commands. Okay, in closing, let me thank again Huntington Ingalls, our sponsors, for making this possible. Please join me in thanking our panelists for taking time to join us. <laughs>